chain. Across the Atlantic is a football culture where political influences have been minimal, but where money and economics have been critical. A lack of resources is hardly an issue among the growing number of soccer devotees in the United States. Soccer is now the most popular youth sport in a country that has created a unique social phenomena known as soccer mums. These are the mothers of America's suburban youth who dedicate an ever-increasing amount of energy, making sure that their children spend leisure time playing soccer. Soccer is part of the fabric of society of the upper uh, third of, of wealth in the country. It's one of the chosen sports. Um, it's kind of seen as a, um, as a thing that you want to see your children doing and that you'll contribute a lot of time and energy and money to see them be successful. People who can't even afford it make sure their kids get on select teams and then find a way to afford it uh, just to keep up with everybody. And that's typical across the country. It is easy to imagine that soccer is new to America, that the youth soccer boom is linked to the incredible successes of the U.S. women's team, or the 1994 World Cup, which America hosted. But soccer in the States goes back a long way. America enjoyed a golden decade after the creation of the American Soccer League in 1921. The Fall River team from a mill town in Massachusetts, here winning the 1924 championship, regularly drew 15,000 supporters. Their best players were American-born. By 1930, there were over 200 registered clubs in the USA. The Great Economic Depression of the 1930s put pay to this golden era of American soccer. During the isolation of the Depression years, it was American sports that flourished. Soccer started to be considered un-American, a perception that grew and grew no matter what they tried. There was one congressman, very well-known congressman, who had played professional football, American football, who made a statement once in, uh, in, the, the, uh, in Congress that all this effort to propagate soccer was in fact uh, an, an infiltration of communist thought into the minds of American kids. Though it was an interest in soccer of a well-known politician that allowed the Americans to monitor events in Cuba during the Cold War. The Soviets were building a naval base in a town called Cienfuegos. And the reason we were on to it is because we saw a soccer field there. And uh, we know the Cubans don't play soccer. And we had never seen a soccer field from the air in Cuba. I was probably more sensitive to the significance of it, that this, this didn't mean that the Cubans had suddenly started to learn soccer. It was much more likely that there was a Russian troop unit there. In the 1960s, it was felt that soccer needed to be sold to the American public. Something big needed to be done. The formation of the North American Soccer League, the NASL, in 1968 sold soccer to corporate America. The game became big business overnight, attracting investment from backers like the co-founder of the Super Bowl, Lamar Hunt. The philosophy behind the North American Soccer League was to build a successful sport financially. Uh, we weren't looking to be charitable. We were trying to uh, uh, build a business that would have lasting quality like uh, American football has and be a successful venture financially. Under the Californian sun, a German center forward kicks off the first professional soccer season in North America. There are no Americans on the field except the referee. A global audience of 400 million television viewers for the 1966 World Cup finals had helped convince corporate America to back professional soccer. And although progress was slow at first, it did catch on. Rodney 
It was a continuing battle to interest an often apathetic public and a hostile media, not just within America. From talking to people out in the sort of wider world, everyone thinks everything we did was, was, was crazy. It wasn't. There was logic behind it. It wasn't American ideas behind it. There were mostly British ideas behind it. And they, they had, I said, logic and rationale behind them. We did make a few outrageous statements. If we did try some experiments that FIFA didn't like, well, in effect, tough luck, because that's what we had to do to make an impact. It was not just the club game in America which had a long history. In 1924, the American national team took part in the Paris Olympics before touring Poland and the British Isles. Indeed, in 1895, America and Canada had played the first international match outside of Britain. In 1930, the US reached the semi-finals of the First World Cup and then beat England 1-0 in the 1950 finals. Yet still, the game struggled. I never played with an American-born player until I joined the national team and uh, met Kyle Rowe Jr. Everybody that I played with growing up until the age of 18, 17, 18 years old was of an ethnic background. Very few Americans play the game of soccer. While soccer remained an amateur, almost underground pursuit for the ethnic minorities, the big time, big money sports of gridiron football and baseball were awash with all American heroes. We were familiar with the, the big names of other sports and we felt that we really had to get big names from soccer. Well, those were all overseas people and, uh, and Pele was the biggest and the best. In 1975, at a price of $7 million, Pele signed for the New York Cosmos. The NASL started to flourish. Porque nos Estados Unidos eu tinha a oportunidade de estudar porque eu queria uh, estudar marketing esportivo. Eu queria que meus filhos tivessem inglês. E a outra coisa também que era muito importante que o campeonato americano era cinco ou seis meses no máximo e não tem a pressão even at 34, Pele was still in a class of his own. No começo, eu sofri muito com Cosmo, porque o Cosmo perdia muito, que era um time de quase garotos de colégio. During halftime of Pele's first game with the Cosmos, Pele came into the dressing room and, and asked us not to pass him the ball that often because he was getting exhausted. In 1977, Pele led Cosmos to the NASL title. I think it was 77, Father's Day 77, when we saw the Cosmos outdraw the Yankees and Mets combined. I think it was playoffs in 1977 when we sold out the stadium on a regular basis, standing room only, 78,000, which had never been done even by the Giants. And then a couple of moments, some, some really major games where we actually played well. Confidence was at an all-time peak. This league will become as big as the NFL is, and, uh, and that this country, North America, will become the center of world soccer. Following the success of New York Cosmos, who had attracted Warner Brothers as their backers, the NASL expanded to 24 teams. The problem was the Cosmos were the exception rather than the rule. The six new owners who had been wooed by the sight of a packed Yankee stadium had entered into soccer for a quick dollar. But by the early 1980s, the NASL experiment began to falter. Many of the owners got concerned about the increasing costs and, and one by one they decided that uh, it wasn't going to happen as soon as they liked it to happen. Success wouldn't come early. In 1984, the league folded. The legacy? A whole generation brought up on soccer. You see that today, the United States has a football, our soccer, 
é, entre os jovens é um dos maiores esportes nos Estados Unidos. E eu me orgulho muito de ter entende, incentivado isso lá nos Estados Unidos. The inaugural game of Major League Soccer is presented by... On the heels of the huge financial success of the 1994 World Cup, for the third time in American history, a new professional soccer league, Major League Soccer, was launched in 1996. MLS isn't as successful as the NASL was in its best days. MLS may never be as successful as the NESL was in its best days. Um, you know, among other things, you couldn't possibly sign the players that we signed. They have tremendous advantages. Years of soccer being thought of as an American sport now. Soccer moms, you know, electing presidents and suburbs full of kids playing soccer and commercials on television using a soccer ball or soccer players as an image depicting typical American life. Now, typical American life is soccer. You know, that's, that's like saying we're all going to start speaking Swahili tomorrow. You know, I mean, it's just unthinkable. The culture of football in the States survived by adapting itself to the American way of life. The passion and support found in the rest of the world just doesn't quite exist in the same way. But it is a culture that refuses to be destroyed. I think if we're conservative uh, and don't lose our minds on thinking that we've got to bring a bunch of foreign players in, I think the sport can grow. I'm seeing definite signs that the American male players are becoming more competitive, more able to hold their own. We're not going to win the World Cup right away, but maybe sometime in the lifetime of my children, the United States will be able to compete at that high level.